If you find yourself in a class all by yourself, you might be in HTM school. Hello and welcome to HTM School. I am Matt Taylor from Nementa. In our last episode, we talked about why SDRs are fault tolerant and noise tolerant. In today's episode, we're going to talk about sets of SDRs and unions of SDRs. If you remember from episode two, SDRs have semantic meaning in HTM systems. This means that SDRs with similar overlaps have similar semantic meanings. Imagine a stream of SDRs. And also imagine that we're collecting these SDRs and putting them into different sets as they're coming across the stream. So we've got these different buckets that we're putting these SDRs. Over time, those will collect into a significant amount of SDRs in each set. Now, as each new SDR comes down the stream, we can compare it to all these different sets to see if we've seen it before and potentially understand what it might represent. So let's see a visualization of SDRs and sets in action. So here we have an SDR of 256 bits with four bits on, that is a 2% sparsity, and that's what this is drawn right here. And what's gonna happen is I'm gonna click this button, add SDR to stack, and it will drop that SDR down below the button bar here. And every time I click it, it will generate a new SDR and drop the last one down into the stack. So this is going to give us a big stack of randomly generated SDRs. It's keeping track of how many stacks are in the set. And I also can click this button to add, I think, 50 all at one time. So then we'll end up with 63 SDRs in this stack. So now we can take one of those SDRs, I'm gonna click this match button, and we'll click one of those SDRs randomly and sort of simulate uh, that <clears throat> we're seeing this SDR again. So again, imagine this scenario where we've had a stream of SDRs and we're taking some of them out and putting them in this set because we want to compare the SDRs that are coming through this stream to that set to see if we've seen it before. So when I click this SDR, so some random SDR in the stack, it is going to bring it up top here. This is the SDR that I clicked. It's gonna highlight it down at the bottom. That's what this orangish highlight around it is. And it's going to rearrange this stack and order it by the overlap scores of every single SDR versus the one that I selected. So as we can see here, it identified the one I selected as having the highest overlap score and it ranked up to the top, winning this competition. I have a noise slider up here so I can add bits of noise to it I slide it up and add one bit of noise. As you can see, the overlap score of that SDR that we matched against went down because now I have one bit of noise in it. So now it's only an overlap of three. So another interesting thing that I wanna show off here, let me refresh this. I'm going to click this calculate false positive button. And what this will do is as I add more SDRs to the stack, it'll do a calculation to tell us What's the probability that some random SDR will match against an SDR in the stack when it's not really a match? So initially, I'm just gonna add a couple of SDRs to the stack here. Here's our probability of false positive. Currently it is 2.3 times 10 to the negative eighth, which is a significantly small number, but not too small. Watch what happens to this number as I continue to add SDRs to the stack. It goes higher and higher and higher and let's add a bunch, I'm gonna add 50. That number goes up a lot, add another 50, it goes up even more. So the more SDRs that we have in the stack, the higher the probability of getting a false positive because there's more chance of random collisions between data that we have and the data that's incoming. So all of this gets much more interesting when we're dealing with bigger SDRs. Now I have increased the size of the SDRs we're looking at from uh, 256 to 2048 bits. Uh, just so you know, I'm not displaying all of them. So these SDRs go onward and I'm doing the math on the complete SDRs, but I'm only visualizing a percentage of them so that they can all fit on our screen. So uh, at this dimension, let's add a bunch of SDRs to the stack. Right now I have 53. Uh, let's get it up to over 100. So now we'll have 103 in the stack and click match. So 
if I click a random SDR out of here, and again, we're trying to sort of simulate that we're seeing something, we want to figure out if we've seen it before or not. Um, at this dimensionality, uh, look how steep this, this curve is here um, for the one that we actually identified as the matching SDR versus others that aren't even coming close. And you might notice that I'm adding 10 bits of noise to this. So 25% of these bits are actually noise. If I take the noise all the way down, then um, we'll get an overlap score of 40, or at least we should, once the slider ticks all the way down. <clears throat> yeah, so we get an overlap score of exactly 40, uh, but you can see how resilient this set comparison method is to noise. Even if we add 50% noise, I could still adjust my theta to uh, 20, 20 something, and uh, we still have a significantly steep curve here and a, a nice chance, a, a very high chance that we're going to be identifying the proper SDR. Yes, we have seen this SDR before. So, um, and we can also calculate the, the false positive rate for this as well as we add more SDRs to it. Um, so uh, in a stack of 104 different SDRs of this, of this dimensionality, uh, the false positive chance that's just some random SDR will match something in there that we actually haven't seen is uh, 2.5 times 10 to the negative 24. So significantly low number, not astronomically low, but pretty low. The problem with this, this type of classification is that it's, uh, it's a lot of calculations. I've got to go and take that incoming SDR and compare it to every single one of the SDRs in the set to get an overlap score. And that is very expensive, as you might have noticed from the responsiveness of this visualization. But that's where we go and start talking about unions. So as you hopefully remember from previous episodes, a union is where you take one or more SDRs or bit arrays and you OR them together. So we're going to turn bits on if any of the bits in that space are on in the ones we're comparing. So now we're looking at unions. In this visualization, I have uh, another SDR on top here. We're, we're going to start off dealing with another 256-bit array with four bits on. That's a 2% sparsity. And it's the same thing. When I click this button, it's going to dump down here onto the stack. And I'm keeping a stack down here at the bottom, but I'm also keeping track of the union of the stack, right? Every time I add an SDR to the stack, I'm also going to OR it into that union. So the more SDRs we add, like here's, I'm adding 20 at a time now, I'm going to make this set really big. I've got 75 different SDRs in this stack right now. This union gets denser and denser and denser. So now if we take a random SDR, when I click this match random button, it uh, will tell us that uh, given this, this union, our chance of a false positive is about 23%, which is pretty bad. Um, so every time I click this match random button, there's about a 23% chance that some random SDR will overlap with that union by the four bits that are required for an exact match, which makes sense because this union is super populated. So, you know, I would, would expect that 25% of those of these random SDRs would match. So the more you click, and I, you can see over here, I'm plotting or I'm showing the overlap score, um, about a quarter of them will, will actually match. You can see the match indicator here. Um, so the more I add to the stack, now I have 95, now I've got uh, 115, that probability of false positive goes up and up. And so now I'm matching and about 50% of them will just be random matches. You know, we don't want that, right? We don't want random matches. So let's make our SDRs bigger. I'm clicking the Go Big button once again, and we're going back to a 2048-bit SDR with a W of 40, so 2% sparsity again. So um, keep in mind, again, that the, I'm only displaying the first 256 bits in the visualization, but I'm doing the math on the entire SDRs. So let's add some SDRs to the stack. And one thing you notice immediately is the chance of a false positive is much, much lower because we're dealing with much bigger SDRs. So as I add to the stack, yes, it continues to go higher and higher, the higher chance of a false positive. 
Let's add uh, 20 at a time. So now at this point, I have 49. Let's make this an even 50. 50 SDRs in my union. So you can see them represented all down here in this stack of, of 50 SDRs in this set. And the probability of any new random SDR I mean, compared to that union for an overlap of, a, of an exact match of 40 bits, the chance of that happening is 7.8 to times 10 to the negative ninth power. So pretty low, not uh, hugely low, but pretty low. And um, so we can see that happening when we start matching random. We're never going to get a random match. I could sit here and click for probably weeks and never get a random match with a probability of false positive that low. If we continue to add more and more SDRs, that probability of false positive will continue to go up um, until we've saturated that union to the point where we're starting to get a lot of false positives. So the more I, I add to the set, the denser and denser this union gets. You can see right here, the union is at this point at 93% density. It's really surprising that even with a union at 93% bits on, the chance of a false positive is still only 4%. So that's still pretty low when you're saying, you're just taking some random SDR and seeing if you've seen it before. It's 4% chance you're not gonna be right or it's gonna be a false positive. You're gonna identify something you thought you've seen, but you haven't. So, uh, and the calculation for doing that comparison is just so much faster than it is if you're keeping the entire set and every SDR in the set. So, wow, this has been uh, the third episode that we've done just on SDRs. It's time to move on to something else, but I need your help to decide what. We could go in one direction, we could talk about encoders, and encoders actually take real world data and convert them in some way into representations that have semantic meanings. So we'll talk about binary representations with semantic meanings and how we can encode meaning into those bits. And that's more the sensory aspect of things as far as HTM systems. Or we could go and talk about spatial pooling, which is a mechanism for normalizing SDRs in a spatial aspect. And that's more of a cortical process. So that would dive right into the cortical theory. It's up to you. I want to know what you think. Should we go with encoders? Should we go with spatial pooling? We're going to get to both of them eventually. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. Don't forget, like this video if you're enjoying this series, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and I'll keep making them for you. Thanks again for watching HTM School. Every time I add a new stack, or a new uh, SDR to the stack, 